Not far from the workshop, we are fortunate enough to have this wonderful historic house. It was built in 1793, and it's been renovated several times since. But it was really the epitome of the English country manor. Today it's looked after by the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. And up on the second floor in the bride's room, there's a wonderful old mirror I want to show you. A nice big room with a canopy bed and a large plum-covered sofa. But over here is what I wanted you to see, this freestanding roll-around mirror. Now, if you think about it, this is a lot better idea than just a mirror hanging on the wall, especially when you're trying to get the whole picture. Now, don't get me wrong, but we're not going to be able to duplicate these 19th century details back at the workshop, but you get the general idea. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. Now, when it came time to size our standing mirror, I decided to make it a little bit smaller than those antiques that we saw. Those mirrors were massive, and they usually sat in large rooms with high ceilings. And that's luxury that most of us don't have. Also, because of their size, they were very heavy. The larger the piece of mirror, the heavier it is. So I made mine about 18 inches wide and about 68 inches tall. That way, a six-foot person like myself, standing back only about three or four feet, can get the whole picture. Now, to add a little bit of elegance to the mirror, I decided to do an arched top. It looks difficult, but it's not bad. Now, here's the stock I'm going to use for the frame of the mirror. It's one and an eighth inch thick mahogany. Now, the first thing that I did to get started was actually make a tool in the form of this template. It's just a piece of quarter-inch plywood, and I laid out the inside radius of the arch and the outside radius of the arch. Now, I suppose I could cut this arch out of one single 12-inch wide piece of stock. And first of all, that would be very wasteful because all this would get thrown away. And up here, you see the grain? It's running pretty much along the length of the arch. But as I move down towards the ears, it starts to become perpendicular to the length of the arch and that's very weak. So traditionally, arches like this were made from several glued up pieces. One here, one here, one here, and one here. Now all the pieces for the arch are cut at the same angle, 22 and a half degrees. Now this first piece will sit right here. And you'll note that I've made it a little bit longer. The bottom edge will be trimmed off later. Now all I have to do is cut the other three segments. Okay. That fits pretty well. Now this is a tough piece to clamp up when it's glued. And I discovered in building the prototype that if I knocked off the corners of these two bottom pieces, it was helpful. Now the cut will be 90 degrees to this face. And I'll make it at the miter box. I'm going to reinforce each of these joints by using a couple number zero biscuits. I want to lay them out carefully because I don't want them to show through the final cut. So what I'm doing is going about an inch and an eighth from the inside of the angle. Now by readjusting the fence slightly, I get the second slot for the other biscuit. OK, I think that's everything. Now, getting ready to glue this arch together is sort of like getting ready to make a heart transplant operation. You better have all the tools close at hand, or else the patient's going to die. Now, when I made the prototype, I tried to use just a simple strap or band clamp. 
But it didn't work very well because I have an open-ended piece. They wanted to squeeze together. And I just couldn't get enough pressure to close the joints tightly. So I'm going to use a combination of clamps. A pipe clamp along the bottom to keep these pieces from spreading out. A long bar clamp to go right at the midpoint. It'll be up against the pipe. And then some smaller bar clamps to pull this joint together. Now to clamp tightly against the wood, I made some little wedges. And I applied some sandpaper to them so they don't slip as I put the pressure on. So now we're ready. We'll start gluing it up. Find a little adjustment here, and that is as good as I'm going to get it. Now, I can't continue working on this until it's dry, so I'm going to carefully set it aside, and we'll start working on the stand for the mirror. Now, the stand for the mirror is actually quite simple. It starts with a foot that's 20 inches long to give it good stability. Then there's a vertical member that goes into the foot and goes up to the pivot point for the mirror. There's also a cross piece that holds the uprights apart. Now we'll get started by working on the foot, which is cut from a piece of 12 quarter mahogany. I was lucky enough to get the thick mahogany. If you can't find it, you can just glue a couple boards together to make the foot. I did the layout on one side, tracing a poster board template that I made, the shape I wanted. I'm going to cut it over here on the bandsaw, which I've equipped with a one quarter inch wide blade. And that's so that I can easily cut these tight radius corners. The drum sander does a nice job smoothing out most of the contour. It doesn't quite get the last 3 eighths of an inch before the step up. And I'll clean that up just using a fine rasp. Boy, the drill press is coming in handy today. First with the drum sander, now with the mortising attachment, which I'm going to use to mortise a hole in the top of each foot into which the vertical standard will fit. Now while the mortising attachment is still in the drill press, I want to make a mortise in these vertical pieces to receive this cross rail. I've laid the mortises out on my stock, which is 8 quarter, or inch and 5 eighths thick. It's 2 and a quarter inches wide, and the mortise is centered across the width. I want to drill it about an inch deep. Well, next we'll make the tenons on the bottom of the standards. And the first thing I want to do is make a shoulder cut all the way around all four sides about a quarter of an inch deep. So I've set up a guide block to position the piece properly in relation to the saw blade. And I've raised the blade to a quarter of an inch. And now I can run them through just using my miter gauge as a guide. Now for the cross piece that joins the two standards, I need to make similar shoulder cuts on each end, but this time only an inch in. So I have to readjust my fence. First I'll move my stop block. Then measuring from my stop block, I'll set it at one inch. Move my block back and run them through. Now, 
Now the bandsaw is a good choice to remove the rest of the material to form the tenon. And what I like to do is adjust it for what it should be and then go in and just nick the ends a little bit. Now as a final check before I actually cut the tenon, I bring it over to the actual mortise and see if it's going to be okay. And that looks pretty good, so I can run them through. Okay, now to complete the tenon, I have to move my fence to inch and three-eighths for the cheek cuts. And I'll use the same process of testing it. I'd say that's going to be fine. Now to complete the tenons on the end of the cross piece, to fit into this mortise, I'll use the same techniques. Okay, let's try that. Good. Now we'll mold the edges. Now the first edge that I want to mold is the top of the standards, both on the outside and on the inside. Now the trick here is to hold the router base flat on top of that standard. There's not a lot of room. Now I'm going to use a OG bit, a 5 30 seconds OG bit, which is equipped with a little ball bearing to guide it along the side of the piece. Okay, now to mold the edges of the standards, I could use just the router bit with the ball bearing, and it works fine until I get right here. Then the ball bearing is going to want to follow the previously molded edge. So I've installed a guide fence, which will help me keep the bit running straight past that intersection. I just molded the four edges of the cross piece with the same bit I used to do the standards. Now for some final sanding. Okay, well that takes care of all the sanding of the parts for the stand. But before I put it together, there's one more thing I want to do. And that's to drill a hole through the uprights for this swivel screw. And that has to be perfectly straight and perpendicular. The best tool to do that with is the drill press. Well, now it's time for another glue up. A little bit of glue on the tenon. Just spread it out evenly. And I've already put a little bit inside of the mortise. Now all I have to do is just slip the pieces together. Okay, that's nice and snug. No need for any clamps here. Now just slip the tenons from the center piece into the uprights. And here I will use a clamp to hold it together while I set it aside to dry. Now the first step in forming the arch is to trim the bottom edges right here along the radius line. And I'll do that over at the table saw. Now the first step is to just cut through this leg. I don't want to cut all the way through because I want to preserve the center part of my template. Now 
Now over here at the bandsaw, I've set up my circle cutting jig, which is really just a piece of plywood that extends the table. And along it, there are several holes which represent different radii. Now this pin right here is for the outside of our arch. So I slip the template over the pin, and by rotating the entire piece, I'll be able to cut the outside radius. You've got to cut the outside first, because if I cut the inside, I'll no longer have a pivot point. I'll simply move the pin to the inside radius hole and repeat the process. The sequence is very important here, and when I rough cut the sides for the mirror, I made them a little bit wider than necessary, and that's because I can't determine the final width until the sanding of the arch has been completed. Now that that's done, I can size the piece. You can see I need to trim about an eighth of an inch, and I'll do that at the table saw. Now's the time to mold the inside edge of all the straight pieces of the frame. And I use the same OG bit as I used on the stand. Let's take a look at the back of our prototype. Now these little cleats here are just temporary to hold the hardboard backing and the mirror in place. I'll have to remove those to put the finish on. But the backing and the mirror actually sit in a rabbit that's cut in all the frame members. I want to make the rabbit in the straight pieces now. So I've set up my stacked dado head cutter in the table saw and attached a wooden auxiliary fence to protect the cutter from hitting the metal fence. And now I'm ready to run them through. Well, now I'm ready to cut all the straight pieces to the correct length. Now the top of the side pieces will just get a square cut, butts up against the arch. The length of the side piece from the square cut to the long point of a 45 degree miter will be 48 and 3 16 inches. Now the most accurate way to mark the bottom piece is to take it and place it against the arch and simply mark the very outside point of the arch on each end. And that'll give me the long point of my 45 degree angle. Now all the other joints of the frame will be secured with biscuits, just like the arch. I'm going to assemble the bottom corners of the frame first. Some more glue for the biscuits. And we'll just first press it together. Now you could permanently set this with just a couple nails to hold it while the glue dries. But I have these corner clamps. This is one of several different varieties. What I like about these is that they have some soft rubber feet which prevent it from marking up the wood as it's clamped in place. Okay, and now we're ready for the arch. Now this clamp that's setting just below the arch area is actually just there to prevent everything from spreading too far as it's clamped together, spreading too far apart. I'll just slip these snugly in place. Now one pipe clamp 
right along the middle to pull the top down tightly. Okay, now we'll just gently clamp that in place, let it dry overnight, and finish it up tomorrow. Well, the glue joints on the frame have had plenty of time to dry overnight. They're nice and tight. It's good and strong, too. Now, the last thing that I have to do is take off these two corner clamps, and then I'll sand all the joints nice and smooth. Now, I don't want to rush this sanding step because the smoother and more even I get all these joints, the better the routing operation is going to turn out, which is next. Okay, now I've changed my bit to a 3 8 inch radius beading bit, and that'll do the outside edge of the mirror. With another router bit change to a quarter inch rounding over bit, I can now ease the back edges of the frame. Now with my 3 8 inch rabbiting bit installed in my router, I can gently remove the material on the inside of the arch to make the rabbit that holds the mirror. Let's take one more look at our prototype mirror. The mirror frame pivots on what's called a mirror swivel screw, even though it's sort of a bolt with a decorative end. Now these are available at woodworker supply stores or through their catalogs. The bolt goes through the upright and then threads into this little insert which goes in the mirror frame. Now over here on our frame, I pre-drilled a 3 8 inch diameter hole for the insert to fit into. And then you just thread it into place using a screwdriver. Now some final sanding with some 220 grit sandpaper. And this piece is ready for the finish. One of the things that I like about mahogany is that because it has such a uniform grain, it takes stains very evenly. Now what I'm using here is a Danish oil. It's water soluble and it contains a little wild cherry stain to give it some color. Two or three coats of this and I'll be ready to install the mirror. I know a little girl in my house who's going to spend a lot of time standing in front of this piece. Well, whether it's the mirror or the pie safe, the picnic table, the clock, the step stools, or any of the other new Yankee projects you see here, I hope you have as much fun building them as I did. So until next time, I'm Norm Abram from the New Yankee Workshop.